Water-soluble vitamins is what we need to do to continue this discussion. We're looking at vitamin C and the whole family of B vitamins coming up. Now, this particular video will be vitamin C as well as vitamin B1, 2, and vitamin B3. The other B vitamins will be in another video later. But we need to look at how does vitamin C help your body? What's it really doing? Is it helping fight off infections? And what do all these B vitamins actually do and why are there so many? That's what we gotta figure out. Let's start with vitamin C. You know vitamin C is water soluble. That means it can go into the membranes pretty easily. Vitamin C is also known as ascorbic acid. So vitamin C, ascorbic acid, same thing. Vitamin C is an antioxidant. That means it absorbs electrons. So it pretty much functions in this case, like vitamin E. But what's interesting is while vitamin E absorbs an electron and becomes non-functional, vitamin C can help recycle vitamin E. That means vitamin C can take a vitamin E molecule that already absorbed an electron, so it's non-functional, can take that vitamin E, recycle it back to an active state. So vitamin E is being recycled because of vitamin C. Some other functions of vitamin C is gonna help with some hormones, helping with some enzymatic production and activity, helping with production of certain amino acids, helping the nervous system, as well as converting fat into energy. So there's a whole bunch of things there that really went through. But probably the most arguably the most important is going to be collagen fiber structure. Now, collagen fibers are found throughout your connective tissue. Well, what's connective tissue? Connective tissue are things like your bones. It's found in your skin. It's found around various organs. It's the tendons and ligaments that anchor your actual bones and muscles together. So really, it has a lot of strength to it because holding so many different structures gives it strength to so many different structures. Well, vitamin C helps to make collagen fiber that strong. If you don't have enough vitamin C, you can't make the collagen fibers the proper strength, which means your bones won't be strong enough. Your tendons and ligaments won't be strong enough. Your skin won't be strong enough. The skin can simply tear much easier. Which brings us into what the deficiency is for vitamin C. Vitamin C deficiency is scurvy. You might have heard of scurvy in reference to sailors and pirates back a couple hundred years ago. When you had the boats that were under sail power only, no motors. And it would take a whole long time to cross the ocean. Well, a lot of sailors become vitamin C deficient, resulting in scurvy. What they end up doing is they bring bags of limes or lemons or oranges, something citrus based, so they can have those across the voyage to help get some vitamin C in their bodies. But the symptoms of scurvy, a lot of times you have bleeding gums, you're going to have painful joints, you're also going to have easier infection into your tissues because the tissues just aren't strong enough. But adequate vitamin C can prevent all that from occurring. Now, an interesting side note on amounts of vitamin C. We cannot produce vitamin C. We have to ingest it. But most other mammals can produce vitamin C. So it seemed like as evolution kind of went on, we lost the ability to produce vitamin C as humans and certain primates. Kind of a weird side note of, it'd be nice to have that, but unfortunately we have to make sure we ingest enough at this point. So what is enough and where do you get it from? Well, you can find vitamin C in citrus. So think oranges, lemons, limes, grapefruits. You can find it in certain juices like orange juice, grapefruit juice. You'll find it in sweet red peppers, tomatoes, broccoli. So plenty of ways to get vitamin C, but how much do you need? As an infant, the recommended daily allowance 
is about 40 or 50 milligrams. But what's interesting here is that recommended daily allowance goes down through childhood and then back up again for adults. By the time you reach adult age, you're looking at 90 or 75 milligrams, again, that male-female split, 90 or 75 milligrams as a daily allowance. But there is an upper limit here, 2,000 milligrams. I mean, that's quite a bit more than your daily allowance. But 2,000 milligrams is the upper limit. If you reach that, diarrhea, nausea, pretty much GI unrest. So it's not the end of the world to hit it, but there's really no point to be that high. Which brings us to another interesting side note. Maybe you've been in the grocery store or you've been in a pharmacy and you've seen those advertisements or seen the containers that are, hey, mega doses of vitamin C helps you get over your infection faster, makes you feel better sooner. Well, these mega doses of vitamin C, unfortunately, there's no scientific research saying they work. There's been a ton of research out there trying to see if mega doses of vitamin C reduce the severity of an infection or reduce the length of an infection. Unfortunately, the research hasn't found any link. So while these mega doses won't really hurt you, they unfortunately don't really help either. So it's one of those things, as long as you're having an adequate amount in your diet, your immune system's functioning the way it should in that regard. Obviously, there's other things that help contribute to the immune system as well. But vitamin C, just need that recommended daily allowance. All right, let's shift over to the B vitamins. They're still water soluble, just like vitamin C was. But there's a whole family, a whole grouping of them. And each one of the B vitamins has its own distinct function, its own purpose in our body. So while they all share the same commonality of a B vitamin, they each have their own purpose. Let's start with vitamin B1 or thymine. Vitamin B1, thymine, is going to be used in metabolism. Now, you can still undergo metabolism if you're low on vitamin B1, but your metabolism won't be as efficient, which means glycolysis, the citrus acid cycle. Neither one of those are going to be functioning as efficiently as they could. So that glucose molecule won't be producing as many ATP as it could have if there was an adequate amount of vitamin B1. So glycolysis, citric acid cycle are both kind of reduced in functionality. But B1 is also important in production of DNA, RNA, ATP, proteins, neurotransmitters. There's a whole series of things here that are necessary. So it's kind of important to keep that vitamin B1 level up. So what happens if you don't have enough? It's referred to as beriberi, which if you have beriberi, symptoms include confusion, painful muscle movements, fatigue, swelling of your extremities, and in extreme cases, cardiac failure. So vitamin B1, it's kind of a good thing to keep up. So where do you get it from? You're looking at whole grains, fortified foods like cereals, Fish, enriched white rice will have it as well. But how much do you need? Well, infants, 0.2 to 0.3 milligrams to start with. Then it increases up through adulthood to 1.2, 1.1 milligrams. Again, male, female split there. So you don't need a ton of it. Remember, we're in micronutrients, small amounts. But you do still need to have it on a daily basis. Next one, B2, riboflavin. Riboflavin is a dealing with protein, lipid, carbohydrate metabolism. So for all your metabolic processes there, you really need to have B2 or riboflavin. Now it's also important for other B vitamins. B6 and B9 will need B2 as a coenzyme. So it helps out with future ones we'll talk about. Basically allows B6 and B9 to be active into their active forms. Excess B2 can end up showing up in your urine. If all of a sudden the urine looks very bright yellow, 
That's because it has excess B2 in it due to the flavin ring. The flavin ring creates that bright yellow color. So how about deficiency? Now, deficiencies are rare, but they can occur. But usually deficiency is paired with other deficiencies as well. It's not just B2, it's B2 and several other things. But it's more common in individuals that suffer from alcoholism. Symptoms, dry, scaly skin. Cracking lips will also be there. So where do you find it? You can find it in milk and dairy. But an interesting thing here, if you ever notice those milk containers, most of them are opaque. Reason being is because sunlight or light in general can damage riboflavin. So while you used to have milk in glass containers, and you still might find it around from some dairies, most of the milk is in opaque containers to try to preserve that riboflavin. Keep B2 intact. Well, you can also find it though in eggs, meat, and the various fortified foods, things like cereals again. How much do you need? The RDA, or Recommended Daily Allowance, starts at about 0.3 milligrams and goes up to 1.1, 1.3, again, male-female split there, milligrams. So again, not a lot, we're talking micro. On to B3, niacin. B3 or niacin, this one can be synthesized in your bodies from tryptophan. We'll only do that if all the other uses for tryptophan are done. So if your body has done all the protein synthesis, it's used all the tryptophan it needs, then it'll go and convert that and make that into B3 or niacin. This is going to be important because components for NADH and NADPH. Now, if you remember those, we've talked about that before. They're used as electron carriers. They're used in catabolism, anabolism, other various proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids you're digesting. ATP production is based on those carriers. So your cell respiration, Cell respiration, we talked about, dealt with NADPH and ADH as those electron carriers already. So without those, it doesn't really work very well for the electron carriers and the overall cell respiration process. Deficiencies. Well, deficiency in B3 is known as pellagra. This is going to have fatigue. A lot of times you have indigestion, can have a decreased appetite. If it continues beyond that, so it gets worse and worse, you then run into the four Ds. You have diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia, and eventually death if it gets that far. So where do you get vitamin B3 from or niacin? You're looking at meats, peanuts even, as well as fortified foods. So how much do you need in a day? What's the RDA? In infants, you're looking at about two milligrams up to adulthood being about 16 or 14, again, that's that male-female split, milligrams in a day. So two up to about 16 or 14. So again, micro basis, not too much, but you do need it on a daily basis. So vitamins C, B1, B2, and B3, all water-soluble vitamins, easy to absorb into your cells. Until the next video.